the chapter on truthfulness. As-sidq literally in Arabic means truthfulness and then the ulama depending on their particular field have their own interpretation of this. From a tasawwuf point of view, the Sufiya, those ulama their definition of a sidq is slightly more open than the literal meaning. Because literally it just means truthfulness. And as we know, when we think of truthfulness from an English perspective and so on, we associate truthfulness only and only to speak, for example, telling the truth and lying. That's, our, you know, that's what comes to mind immediately when you think of truthfulness. So it's just to do with speech. However, the view of the Sufiya regarding Sidq is slightly different. In that it's a broader concept than just uh, lying and speaking the truth. And what they say and this is from the ulama of the Sabbath, they say that it means for someone's hidden and open activities to be exactly the same. So, Sidq is that someone 
is in public as he is away from the eyes of the public. So basically, his, and also, slightly different concept, similar but slightly different concept, that his zahir, his exterior, and his batin, his interior are one. This is, it's a similar concept, but not exactly the same as, uh, you know, being the same in public and in, on your own. That's slightly different from this concept of someone's zahir and his batin, his exterior and interior being exactly the same. Because the first one just means that your behavior should be exactly the same whether you are being watched or whether you are on your own. And the second one actually <coughs> means that your intention, what is in your heart, should be what is manifest through your actions. And your actions should show what is in your heart. And when they are both in accordance, so for example, when you are reading your prayer, right, a lot of us just come down from Salah. When during your Salah, you stand in Qiyam first, and then you, go, you bow into Rabu, and then you fall into Siddha, into prostration. At that point, when you are prostrating, now I don't know if anyone ever sort of paused for a moment and thought about this, but at that point, what is it exactly that you are doing? The most respectable point on your body, your head, and namely your forehead, at that point is placed on the floor, where normally your feet would be and where you would walk. And who are you doing this for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in other words, you are showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before him, you are his humble servant and you know, a slave in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you have no respect, no honor, no dignity in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only honor and dignity and respect that you have comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what he bestows upon you, what he gives you. Is this actually what is inside our hearts? Because truly, no, no, this is just one example. Many other things that come into this concept of siddha and of prostration. So basically, giving yourself up to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Submitting entirely to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And is this what our actions are showing? Are our actions and intentions matching? And when, when we are in Sitta at that moment in time, do we have this sensation and this feeling within our hearts? This is what the Sufiya say is Sitta. Someone who is Sadiq is someone who at that point, having his head in Sitta would be feeling all of these thoughts and, and you know, all the rest of them. To actually be aware of that situation and for his interior, his inside, his, his heart, to be exactly the same as his outside. So if he's in Sajda, his heart to be exactly the same as well. So basically, not only that his head is in Sajda, but at the same time his heart is in Sajda as well. So they are both uh, in line with each other. This is the definition of Sajda that we attain from the ulama of the Sabu. And this chapter is regarding Sidq. And we will see that this concept of Sidq being wider than just speaking, than just you know, either speaking the truth or speaking and telling the lie. This comes from the ahadith of the Prophet himself. We see this. And as Imam al-Nawabi always does, he begins this chapter by quoting some references from the Holy Quran. The one which I recited before you is the very first one. He says, Qala Allahu Azza wa Jal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O believers, ittaqullah, fear Allah, remain fearful of Allah, وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ And be with the righteous, be with the truthful. 
So Allah's mantra is ordering us here, as well as adopting taqwa, as well as adopting the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we will learn what is taqwa in the coming chapters, there's a whole chapter on from the Prophet وسلم, what is taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, adopt taqwa and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at the same time be with those who are truthful. And be with the truthful, be with the righteous. Immediately something that can be understood from this verse is the fact that being around people who are pious, who are righteous, who are truthful, in itself is a virtue. So this immediately tells us that being in the company and in the vicinity of such people in itself has great benefit. Because company does affect. And we know this from the teachings of Rasulullah that good and bad company both affect. And bad company is actually quicker to affect than good company, to take effect. So Allah subhanahu wa encourages he, here for us to be with those who are truthful. And obviously then, you know, the more uh, obvious sense of this word, word trying to achieve a status where um, you are amongst those people who are righteous and who are truthful. The first hadith in this chapter is a hadith narrated by Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and he, I have mentioned briefly an introduction to Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala but very quickly he was very early to accept Islam and he accepted Islam at a very early age as well. So not only did he accept Islam very early on, he was also quite young at the time. And it's interesting how his sort of uh, mannerisms, how his conduct and behavior was as a young man, as a possibly young, as a young man, as a young boy, prior to accepting Islam, what his morals and his conduct was. Because the Prophet ﷺ saw him in Mecca, in one of the valleys of Mecca, and he was herding sheep and goats at the time. The Prophet ﷺ went up to him and he said, you know, uh, do you have any goats that I can milk? And immediately he said to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I do. He didn't lie, he told the truth, he said, I have, but they don't belong to me. They're not mine, so I can't give them to you. It tells us what sort of uh, you know, a, a, a boy and young man this actually was. Even he was, even before accepting Islam, what his morals and his conduct was. And then the Prophet then said to him, okay, well, give me a goat which you know does not give milk. And so he presented uh, a goat like this to the Prophet and the Prophet he milked this goat, the others became full of milk, and he milked the goat and then gave some to Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud, him to drink, and then also his companions were with him, and then the Prophet himself drank from that. And then after the Prophet had milked this goat, he went back to the way it was before. When he saw this, he was intrigued. He asked, who are you? And the Prophet told him, he said, I am... Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him about Islam and he immediately accepted Islam. Mm -hmm. so very early on, at a young age, he became a Muslim. He narrates this and he said one of the greatest uh, sort of, you know, from amongst the Sahaba, the, one of the most knowledgeable and one of the greatest uh, scholars amongst the Sahaba, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala. And he says, the Prophet said, In the Sidqa Yahdi ila al Bir that truthfulness guides towards good, towards piety. And wa in al birra yahdi ila al jannah and piety, righteousness guides towards Jannah. So basically, the Prophet is saying that this is uh, 
in stages, in steps. The first step, truthfulness. Truthfulness will lead you to piety and righteousness. And righteousness will lead you to them. وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَيَسْلُقُ حَتَّى يُكْتَبَ عِنَّ اللَّهِ صِدِّيقًا A man continuously is truthful until eventually he is decreed or written down, recorded in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Siddiq. But this doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't know beforehand or that this wasn't decreed because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the pen, he created the tablet and he said, write. And the pen wrote and it wrote everything that was going to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is infinite and his knowledge is eternal just as he is. So basically, just as there's no beginning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he's had that knowledge for eternity and his knowledge is infinite. But it means that that person is then officially recorded as someone who is Siddiq. And in the opposite direction, the Prophet said, وَإِنَّ الْكَذِبَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْفُجُوبِ And lying leads someone to be unrighteous. وَإِنَّ الْفُجُورَ يَهْدِي إِلَى النَّارِ And evil then in turn leads towards the hellfire. So lying leads to evil, evil leads towards the hellfire. And similarly, a person lies continuously until eventually he is recorded as a liar. This is a hadith which is related by both Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari. This is Muttafaq alayhi agreed upon. In the second hadith in this chapter, this is narrated by Sayyidina Imam Hassan bin Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he says, I learned from the Prophet وسلم, I memorized something from the Prophet وسلم. What was this? Da'ma yaribuk. Leave that which puts you in doubt. Da'ma yuribuk. Leave everything that is doubtful, that puts you into doubt. Ila mala yuribuk. For everything which does not, or for anything which does not leave you doubtful. Why? The Prophet explained this concept of sidq. How do you know when something truly is righteous, when it is actually true? The Prophet said, فَإِنَّ الصِّدْقَ تَمَانِينَ Truthfulness is peace of mind, is contentment of the heart, is itmina, is contentment of the heart. When you've done something truly that is virtuous and right, your heart will be content. And if you do something and there's a niggling feeling inside of you, something telling you that there's something not quite right, then more than likely what you've done is not quite right. That's why you've got this feeling and this sensation. So, you know, in, in effect, on this matter and in this type of matter, your heart is a mufti. Your heart tells you whether what you've done is right or wrong. If it leaves you doubting and doubtful with questions and wondering and, and so on, and discomfort, then you know that what you've done is not entirely truthful. Well, Kadiba, Riba, and the Prophet said, falsehood leaves you in doubt. Falsehood causes doubt. Falsehood is doubt. This will leave you with, with this feeling inside you. This is something now for us, you know, from a tasawwuf concept, you have now something to weigh out your actions. When you're about to do something, think about it first and think, you know, will this truly leave me with content heart and mind? And then if it doesn't, then inquire about it. Then make, you know, inquire about it and find out whether it is something that you should indulge in or not. Leaving one hadith, moving on to the fourth hadith in this chapter. This hadith is narrated by Sayyidina Abu Sa'id Sahal bin Hudayf, And Imam al he tells us that 
that he was a Badri Sahabi. He was one of those Sahaba who participated in the Battle of Badr. And again, I've, I've mentioned this before, possibly on more than one occasion, the events of the Battle of Badr and why it was so important and why these people are so remarkable. Why Imam uh, An-Nabawi actually takes the time to tell us that he's a Badri Sahab. Uh, because this was uh, a test of absolutely gigantic proportions. And those 313 who stood firm and who stood their ground in face of this test, they hold a remarkable status and they created history you know, for, from an Islamic point of view. So he mentioned that he's one of those brothers Sahaba and he says, the Prophet said, and this is interesting, this shows, this shows us another side of a sidq. Remember, I told you right at the very beginning, your concept of truthfulness, inshallah, will broaden having studied this chapter. Because coming in thinking that truthfulness is just speaking the truth, you will go out knowing that it is actually far broader than this and there's a lot more that comes into this. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man Allah ta'ala shahada bisibdin. Whoever asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for martyrdom with sincerity. I mean, that's the best way we can translate this as uh, sidq here. Because literally, it would be whoever asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truthfully. In other words, with sincerity. So we understand that sincerity is also part of this uh, sidq. Whoever asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity for martyrdom, what does this do? This can change the result of your actions. How? Allah will place him in the ranks of the shuhada. He will be placed in the ranks of the shuhada and amongst the martyrs. Even if he dies on his bed in his sleep. Now, even if he doesn't suffer at all, he dies peacefully in his bed, in his sleep. If he's asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with sincerity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise him into the status and will raise him into the stations of the martyrs of the shuhada. So this tells us that when we, in, when we are truthful in what we do, the outcome Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create according to our intention, according to our sincerity. And again, missing one hadith, moving on to the last hadith in this chapter. Sina Hakim bin Hizam, and he's someone, Imam al he says, he accepted Islam um, the year of the conquest of Makkah. And he was amongst the nobility of the Quraysh, even prior to Islam. Now, so, Prior to and after Islam, he was considered amongst the nobility of the Quraysh. He says, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Bajjiani bil Khiyar Malam Yatafarraqa. The Prophet ﷺ said that traders or a buyer and seller, someone who's buying something, someone who's selling something, both of them have the choice of Cancelling their transaction so they can leave that transaction. How long? As long as they are still together at the time. Once they have accepted, once one has accepted and the other one has taken and they have parted, then that sale is final. Then neither of them has a right to cancel. And you may be wondering what this is actually to do with truthfulness. Again, broadening the scope even further. The Prophet ﷺ says, فَإِنْ صَدَقَ If they are both truthful, وَبَيَّنَا And they both speak the truth. And if there's any... Because remember, trading doesn't have to be goods in exchange of money. It can be goods in exchange of goods. So if they are both truth, truthful and both highlight any faults or deficiencies within their products, 
Burika lahuma fi baydihima. They will be given baraka in their trade, in their transaction. Wa in katama, and if they are deceitful and they try to hide things, wa kadaba and they lie, muhitat baraka tu baydihima. The baraka of their transaction will be taken away. And this is why, you know, people have this question today, again, you know, looking at it from a Tasawwuf point of view. People often question why they earn so much money, and yet none of it sort of, there's no baraka in that money, it doesn't last, you don't you know. And then on the other hand, you look at uh, people who are able to live off very small amounts and still able to save. Why? There's no barakah there. And often because of these reasons. Because we are, in some way or other, we are deceitful. And we hide and conceal things. This is why there's no barakah. When, when that is taken, you could earn millions. But those millions, void of barakah, will not benefit you the same as a dozen or a hundred, a thousand, which is full of barak. And inshallah, within the other salihin, shortly, we will come to a hadith within one of the chapters, which actually explains the concept of halal earning and you know, halal and haram, indulging in halal and staying away from haram. And one of the things is that the, the, the Prophet وسلم, mentions a hadith and the wording is sort of, uh, um, I'm not even going to paraphrase them, it's just the, the gist of that hadith is basically that a person, he comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in tatters and in an absolutely poor state and he seems to be so sincere and he's, you know, he's basically starving and thirsty and in tatters and he seems so sincere and yet he seeks from he seeks from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet says, How can he hope to achieve anything? How can he hope to receive anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when what he's eaten, what is in his stomach is not halal? And so and, and, and also in another hadith the Prophet asked the Prophet, um, Ya Rasulullah, uh, do dua that I become mustajabud da'wat. That means mustajabu da'awat is a status where whatever you seek from Allah, He gives with immediate effect. So any dua you make from Allah, Allah accepts it. This is known as someone who is mustajabu da'awat. And the Prophet was asked this by one of his sahaba, said, Ya Rasulullah, pray that Allah makes me mustajabu da'awat. Think about how immense and how huge this status must be. What was the advice that was given to him by the Prophet ﷺ? The Prophet ﷺ's advice was stay away from haram, indulge in only haram, and you will become mustajab al You know, something which may feel really uh, of not of that huge importance, it tells you the huge importance in that particular hadith. And then we have so many other problems as well. You know, parents complaining about children not being obedient, not being practicing uh, Muslims and so on. And if we go down to, you know, the, if we get to the bones, if we actually look at the whole situation, we understand that the children are not being fed through entirely halal means. Now, honesty, like it mentions here, is a very broad concept. And when you start to play about with this, you end up in a situation where, like the Prophet ﷺ said, that truthfulness is contentment, is peace of mind. Isn't that what everyone struggles for? Really, you know, I ask you this question, think about it deeply. Isn't that what everyone is struggling for? Just peace of mind. Now everything that you do, the ultimate goal, isn't it just to be your heart to be content and your mind to be at peace? 
On the other hand, on one hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inul kulu. The heart's contentment lies in the dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one form of this remembrance is truthfulness, is honesty. Which is why the Prophet was saying that honesty is contentment of the heart. And on the other hand, falsehood, lying, cheating, all of this, this is cause for concern and sort of unrest of the heart. Then this next chapter is Babul Muraqaba. Now, Muraqaba often is translated as meditation. Um, surprising actually to find this in your book, this actually is the correct interpretation. Allah consciousness, being conscious and aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what muraqaba means. So literally translated often as meditation. But not the whole, it doesn't grasp the whole concept. The actual muraqaba that this is going to talk about is awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. Allah is aware of you. Being aware of the fact that Allah is aware of all of your actions. This is Muraqqa. And so, after truthfulness, because truthfulness, remember, will lead you to a stage where you will become constantly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why, this is why the next chapter that comes up is Babu Muraqqa. And the several um, ayat and verses there quoted by Imam and never be. One of them, the second one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is with you wherever you may be. This is Muraqqa. To realize this, to, to make this a realization, is Muraqqa. As for the ahadith, the first hadith in this chapter. This hadith is of absolutely immense importance. And many of the ulama of the science of hadith, they say that just like Surah Al-Fatiha in the Quran, one of its names is Ummul Kitab, or Ummul Quran. Umm in Arabic means mother. It wasn't always, this wasn't the meaning that it was, this word was devised for, um actually means roots and origins. And because the mother is the origin and roots of the child, therefore, um is used and means mother. And just like Al-Fatiha is known as Ummul Kitab, it doesn't mean mother of the book, it means roots, origin, essence, in other words, the essence of the Quran, the essence of the book. This hadith is known as Ummul Sunnah. So it has a similar status amongst a hadith that Al-Fatiha has amongst the surahs of the Qur'an. This is the importance of this hadith. A very, very famous hadith. I'm sure um, most, if not all of you, will have heard this before. Narrated by Sayyidina Umar And Sayyidina Umar, he narrates in the hadith, he says, one day we were sat with the Prophet wasallam when a person came and the person appeared, this person, he was dressed in pure white and his hair was pure black. So basically he was very neat and tidy in his dress, his hair and everything. <laughs> there were no signs of having travel on him. So basically, obviously, as you can imagine, in that time, living in the desert, traveling on camel, or horseback, or walking. If someone had to travel a considerable distance, it would show that he's been traveling. But this person was, he was so, you know, in his, his dress, his hair, everything was so perfect that there were no signs of traveling on him at all. وَلَا يَعْرِفُهُ مِنَّا أَحَدٌ However, none of us recognized him. 
The reason why Sayyidina Umar mentions this is because this was very strange. The fact that no one recognized him, which meant he wasn't local. If he wasn't local, he must have traveled. But there were no signs of traveling on him. So it was quite strange that he was not local. If he was local, someone would have recognized him. And it didn't seem like he traveled from anywhere. He was dressed so uh, perfectly, impeccably. Then he came to the Prophet ﷺ, He came and sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ, like you sit in the tashahud at tahiyyat position with your knees extended in front of you. He sat like this in front of the Prophet ﷺ, joining his knees to the knees of the Prophet ﷺ. In the actual text here in this hadith, it says, فَأَسْمَدَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَىٰ رُكْبَتَيْهِ He joined his knees to his knees. وَوَضَعَ كَفَّيْهِ أَلَىٰ فَخِذَيْهِ And he placed his hands on his thighs. Now this second part, he placed his hands on his thighs. There's no name mentioned there, it's pronouns. وَوَضَعَ كَفَّيْهِ He placed his hands عَلَىٰ فَخِذَيْهِ upon his thighs. So there's a possibility here that he sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ with his hands on his own thighs or he put his hands on the Prophet's thighs. In this hadith he's going to mention but this hadith is narrated by many uh, different chains and different sahaba. The reason why Imam Nabawi and, uh, has chosen and selected the narration of Sayyidina Umar is because of the status of Sayyidina Umar ta'ala amongst the sahaba. Otherwise, there's many other Sahaba who narrated this hadith because there was a gathering of Sahaba around the Prophet ﷺ when this incident took place. So narrated from various different Sahaba. And in one of the other narrations, it mentions وَوَضَعَ كَفَّيْهِ عَلَىٰ فَخِذَيْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. He placed his hands on the Prophet ﷺ's eyes. This is why it's mentioned. Because think about it. The actual hadith is not this person came and how he was dressed and how he sat down. Really, why would Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, why would he go through the trouble of narrating all of this? Why not just go to the, why not just simply say someone came to the Prophet and he asked some questions? Why take all of this time to actually explain how he came and how he was dressed and how he wasn't local, but he couldn't tell you the traveller and he came and he sat down in front of the Prophet ﷺ, his knees touching the Prophet's knees and his hands on the Prophet's thighs. Because this was extremely strange. This was not behavior that the Sahaba were accustomed to. And this was not in line with sort of the etiquettes that they uh, had been sort of uh, practicing in the presence of Rasulullah ﷺ. But they remained quiet because the Prophet ﷺ uh, remained quiet. He came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Ya Muhammad. Again, something surprising because the Sahaba uh, never beckoned the Prophet وسلم, using his name. It was always Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi Allah, and so on. But this person, he said, Ya Muhammad, Akhbir me an Islam. Tell me what is Islam. Tell me about Islam. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Al Islam and Tashala la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammadun Rasulullah. Islam is that you testify that there is no God but Allah, wa anna Muhammadun Rasulullah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. That you establish prayer, that you pay zakat, that you fast during the month of Ramadan, and that you perform the pilgrimage of the Kaaba of Baytullah and of you know, the holy sites if you are able to do so, if you possess the means to do so. This is Islam. What was his next question? And after this question, he asked the question, he said, tell me about Islam. And when the Prophet ﷺ told him, Islam is that you testify, that you pray, that you fast, that you pay the car, that you do Hajj, what did he do? Qala sadaqta. He said, you are right, you are correct. 
فَعَجِبْ لَا لَهُ We were surprised by him. Extremely surprised. يَسْأَلُهُ وَيُسَدِّقُهُ Asking the question and also affirming that he's correct. Very strange. Why? Why do you ask the question if you don't know? If you know the answer, you don't ask the question. So this is very strange behavior, especially in front of the Prophet He was asking the question and also confirming that the answer was correct. Which means that he knew beforehand. If he knew beforehand, why was he asking the question? Again, then he asked the second question. فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ iman. Then tell me what is Iman. Tell me what is faith. And the Prophet said, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ That you believe in Allah وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ and His angels وَكُتُبِهِ and His books and His prophets and the last day and that you believe that destiny, good and bad, is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know that you believe in good and bad destiny. Again, Qala Sadaqat, he said, You are correct. Then he asked, Ya Rasulullah, Fa akhbir ni alil ihsan. Then tell me what is ihsan. Ihsan here does not mean, you know, the sort of Punjabi or Urdu word ihsan, basically doing someone a favor. This is not the term that is used here. Ihsan, the Prophet ﷺ explains what is Ihsan. This is the soul. Now if you want the soul in a nutshell, this is it. The saying of the Prophet ﷺ, it is Ihsan. What is Ihsan? أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه You worship Allah as if you are watching Him. Not the Prophet ﷺ says, as if you are watching Him. Obviously we can't physically see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we worship Him. So as if you are watching Him. Worship Allah as if you are watching Him. كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ If you can't do this, if you can't envisage watching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاهُ Then certainly, undoubtedly, He is watching you. There are two stages of Ihsan mentioned in this saying of the Prophet The lower one or to start with the higher one, that is that you worship Allah as if you are watching Him. And that if you can't do this, then at least during your worship, know with certainty that He is watching you. And just to explain this sort of better on our terms, obviously no similarity uh, intended or, you know, is no similarity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just an example to explain is you know, for example, a teacher, when he leaves the classroom, if I leave my classroom with a bunch of teenagers and leave them in there, more than likely when I get back, you know, there will be a riot in the classroom. But if I put a camera up in the classroom and leave and I say to them that I'm going to be watching you from my office, behavior patterns will be different. Do you agree? Therefore, it tells us that being watched, this sensation, this realization of the fact that you are being watched, in itself should change your behavior pattern. Even this, the lower form of Ihsan, the, the fact that you are cer with certainty, you realize that you know and believe that Allah is watching you. When you have this realization, it will change your actions and your attitude and will lead you towards the higher stage of Ihsan. And at present, what we need to ask ourselves is, do we even fall into the lower category? Are we actually aware and do we believe with that certainty that we are being watched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we do, then I'm sure a lot of the stuff that we do, we wouldn't. But really, we need to try to, we need to strive to get onto that first step first and then aim for second. Next question. فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then tell me about judgment day. Tell me about the hour. Tell me about judgment day. قَالَ The Prophet said مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّاعِ The one who is being asked the question 
has no does not know more than the one who is asking. It's a very long-winded way of saying, for argument's sake, for those people who you know insist that this means that the Prophet didn't know. It's a very long-winded way of saying I don't know. But the one who is being asked the question does not know more than the one who is asking. Easier to say that or just to say, I don't know. La Abu, La Abu. And what are the Prophet ﷺ's instructions about speech? Khairul Kalam, La Khalla, Watan. The best speech is that which is short and proven. Short and precise. Why then, you know, this string of words? Well, in all honesty, this is used, we're coming to a, an Aqidah issue here, because this is one of those places where people who negate ilm al of the Prophet and of other messengers of anyone other than Allah, well, this is one of those places where they say, well, if the Prophet you know, had knowledge, why did he say this? And that means he didn't have knowledge of when Qiyamah was, when Judgment Day precisely will be, and therefore, he doesn't have any knowledge of the unseen. Quite a weak foundation to actually build that argument on. Because I will tell you that this very hadith, this very same hadith that we are studying now, it, this particular hadith contains within it evidence of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of the unseen. This same hadith. So, and without any doubt, this one is slightly ambiguous because the Prophet didn't outright say, I don't know. But this is what they assume. But the knowledge of the unseen that the Prophet had, this is very evident. And it's coming up in the next question. Also, the fact that the Prophet, all of his knowledge was not given to him right from the very beginning. We need to understand our own aqidah first, and then we will not struggle with these kind of questions. The Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of the unseen. He had the greatest amount of knowledge in all of the creation. But in comparison to Allah Taala's knowledge, there is no comparison. Allah's knowledge is infinite. And the Prophet ﷺ, however great, is, is finite. <coughs> and But with respect to the whole of humanity, the whole of creation, all the knowledge that all the creation has cumulatively does not add up to and anywhere close to the knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ was given. So there's two different comparisons here and no comparison on either side. So when com with, in comparison with Allah's knowledge, no comparison. It's infinite. No bounds at all. And then also the fact that Allah's knowledge is His knowledge. No one and absolutely no one can have any knowledge at all without it being given by Allah Subhanahu wa Another major difference. And Allah Subhanahu wa has given whom he pleases, however much knowledge he pleases, including knowledge of the unseen. And this is something that one of the questions that can the one answer to this question is the fact that at this particular moment the Prophet ﷺ had not yet been <coughs> informed which he later was and this is something that Imam Jalaluddin Sayyuti Ta'ala he, he says this is the correct answer at that time, at that specific time the Prophet ﷺ did not know the specific date of the Day of Judgment but later was informed and this does not go against our Aqidah because the Prophet's knowledge increased gradually until it completed. Because one of the major sources of the knowledge of the Prophet is the Quran, which was revealed gradually. But we know that the Prophet's knowledge increased gradually. But at this particular moment in time, it's not necessary that the Prophet had knowledge. And you can't, basically, it's a mathematical equation. If you think about it, disproving a theory, right, or proving, proving a theory, or di disproving a theory, how many sort of um, evidences, how many proofs do you need 
to disprove the theory. Do you have any mathematician here or anyone who's understanding what I'm saying? How many evidences and proofs would you need to disprove a theory? Just one. In order for that theory to become a law, how many examples do they need to include? All of them. You understand what I'm saying? So, like, for example, you know, whatever you have laws of uh, motion or, or uh, whatever, they apply to absolutely everything. Like, for example, the concept of gravity is universal. Right? Values may differ depending on, you know, the, the mass of the bodies, but it's a universal concept. And it's universally agreed upon. You can't, for, if there was somewhere in the world where there was, you know, basically the concept of gravity cannot be negated wherever you are in the world. If it was somewhere, that would have to be then classed as an anomaly, and it would have to be investigated, and whether this law of gravity is indeed actually a universal law or not. In order to disprove something, you only need one evidence against it to prove that this, no, this is not a universal law. What they say is no one other than Allah possesses any knowledge of the unseen. All you need is one specific incident where anyone other than Allah has shown knowledge of the unseen. And this would disprove their theory entirely. It's far easier for us to actually disprove their theory than them to actually prove their own theory. And from the Quran, and from the Quran, very, very simply, Nuh alayhi salam, towards the end of Surah Nuh, what do you say? وَقَالَ نُوْهُ الرَّبِّ لَا تَذَرْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دِيَّارَ إِنَّكَ إِنْ تَذَرْهُمْ يُضِلُّوا عِبَادَكَ وَلَا يَلِدُوا إِلَّا فَادِرًا كَفَّارًا O Allah, don't leave a single one of these kafir on the face of the earth. Why? If you leave them on the earth, if you let them be, then even their offspring that they give birth to will be kafir and will be valid. Can you expect that Nuh alayhi salam, a prophet and messenger of Allah, is just assuming that their children will be kafir. He's assuming that these people will be kafir. It's not an assumption. He's a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's, he's praying to Allah, saying that even if they have children and offspring, their offspring will not even accept Islam. So, you know, don't leave a single one of them on the face of the earth. This is knowledge of that. Inshallah, you know, when we, when we do come to uh, discussing this ilm al as a separate topic on Aqaid, I will talk through this in detail, but there are literally, I'm not saying this, you know, this is not a figure of speech, it's not an exaggeration, there are literally thousands upon thousands of evidences of those beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having portions of knowledge of the unseen and showing that. Literally thousands upon thousands of examples. So, you know, this is one of the, the sort of, this is possibly the weakest argument that can be raised um, and that is raised against the beliefs of the Ahl Sunnah is negating in the head. But anyway, coming back to this, the last question then he asked Fakhbirni and Amaratiha. Okay, well, tell me the signs of the Day of Judgment. And the Prophet said, Antalid al Amatu Rabbataha, that a, a slave will give birth to her master. How is this possible? A slave, if she gives birth to a child within, you know, who is, whilst she's a slave, then that child by birth is a slave. How can he then become her master, being her biological offspring? Again, another issue. Well, there are many interpretations of this. And you know, some quite literally far-fetched, which makes it possible for this to happen. I think the more apt interpretation is that the Prophet was saying there will come a time when children who are born to their parents will treat their parents like slaves. The treatment of parents will diminish to the point of the extent that their parents will be treated like slaves. We're very close, if not already there. The Prophet said that there will come a time 
when you will see people who are poor, who are dressed in tatters, who are barefooted, who have no clothes, people who herd sheep, basically, you know, shepherds, in tatters, barefooted, poor people. They will compete with each other to build taller and higher buildings. Again, this is something that we see is happening today. People, the backgrounds of people and now what they are doing, how accessible, easily accessible money has become and you know, so on. Um, this is coming true today. These signs did not appear till well after the time that the Prophet mentioned these. So what do you class this as? The knowledge of the unseen proven directly from the next question of this hadith very emphatically and very clearly. It would be very stupid to actually argue against that on an ambiguous sort of a, a statement which, which can go either way um, and then not actually, actually neglecting. This is quite a, um, you know, it's a remarkable habit reading half a ayah and leaving the other half of the ayah, or reading half a hadith and leaving the other half and so on. You know, uh, it's quite remarkable how that can be done. But um, this very hadith. And Sayyidina Umar, عنه, he says that, um, I stayed for a while, this person went, and after a while, the Prophet asked me, Oh Umar, did you know who this was? And I said, uh, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Now, something which the Sahaba always said, something which I find quite intriguing. Never Allahu Alam, always Allahu wa Rasuluhu Alam. Allah and His Messenger know best. And the Prophet said, This was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. So this, you, you understand now why this is, has such an importance, such a huge importance, this hadith. And I'm just going to leave you with one thought, something you can actually, something that you can think about. Um, so I see you next time, inshallah, and then you know we'll discuss this next time. And that is that um, the first question was, what is Islam? And that was the answer to that. The Prophet Islam gave was, Islam is to declare with tongue your belief in Allah and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And obviously prayer and the God and Hajj and fasting and so on. The second question was what is Iman? Faith. Again, these were articles of faith to believe in Allah and His messengers and His books and the Day of Judgment and so on. Now, ask you a question and again this is not a rhetorical question. So do respond. And respond actively. Do you believe in Allah? Yes. yes. What do you believe? Again, not a rhetorical question. What do you believe? Is it all powerful? All powerful. All mine, all seen. Good. What we what you believe is you believe and you are you learn the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his qualities, his attributes, Amatu Billahi Kamahua. I believe in Allah as He is with His names and attributes. But these attributes are supposed to have an effect on you. This is something I, I which I wanted to, to bring to light. When you say He is all powerful, what effect does this actually have on you? What sentiments does this inspire within you? Because really, if you truly believe that Allah is all powerful, then you should fear him. Right? But also, you know he is Rahman and Rahim. And therefore, if you seek forgiveness from him, he is Ghafoor, he forgives, he is Tawab, he uh, accepts repentance. When you repent, and you seek forgiveness, and you try to become close to him, and you know that he is all powerful, you should also feel a sense of protection when you entrust yourself into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should feel a sense of protection. Every single attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you believe in should inspire a different feeling within you. When you believe that He's all-knowing and all-seeing, all-hearing, 
you should then know that there is absolutely no way and nowhere you can hide from me. No matter what you do, where you are, you cannot hide from him. You cannot conceal anything from him. He knows the thoughts in your heart and mind. Again, this should inspire some sentiment within you. This is something to leave you to think about. Now, the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on his attributes. Study them. What are they? What should that actually inspire within you? Does it? Are we there at that stage of Iman? Or are we just Muslim? Any, any questions? Also, um, we are thinking of starting a Tafsir class, um, which will be Tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Al-Baqarah. Um, hopefully, which, should, which will run for about three months, roughly. Um, now, the, the, the available time slots for this were Sunday afternoon after Zohar or Thursday evening at this time or Monday evening at this time. There were three possible slots. Um, do people have any particular preference out of those three? Weekdays. Yeah, I've got three days. Monday or Thursday? Monday. 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 Most people agree with Monday? Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, okay. Inshallah, we, we will be informed yeah. beforehand, obviously, yeah. before it starts and so on. Uh, but that is something that we have in the planning, hopefully, inshallah, within the next few weeks. <coughs> اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا مولانا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وادخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عليم يا غفار يا رب العالمين صلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الله